Uprooted from their homes in unprecedented numbers by violence, war and persecution, the UN Refugee Agency says the world is failing to stem a staggering rise in human suffering, unwilling or simply unable. This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. A stark report from the UN Refugee Agency is painting a bleak picture of a world at war, with each person displaced or trapped by conflict, a tragic story. The number of people forced from their countries and their homes is the highest on record, and the UN is warning that the world is failing the victims of global violence and persecution. Almost 60 million people were exiled by conflict last year. That's a rise of more than 8 million from 2013 and the highest ever increase in a single year. It means one in every 122 people on the planet is a refugee, internally displaced or seeking asylum. One clearly gets the impression that the world is at war. And indeed many areas of the world are today in a completely chaotic situation and the result is this staggering escalation of displacement, this staggering escalation of human suffering because each displaced person is a tragic story. UN agencies, NGOs, the Red Cross, Red Crescent Society, we do no longer have the capacity and the resources to respond to such a dramatic increase in humanitarian needs in the world. It is dramatic to see how xenophobia has developed in some parts of the world. It is dramatic to see that many seeking protection and seeking to rebuild a new life find, unfortunately, the death in uh, the movements they made. The biggest driver of last year's surge was a civil war in Syria. In fact, one in five displaced people worldwide last year was Syrian. Bernard Smith sent this update for Inside Story from San Liofa, near Turkey's border with Syria. So these tents are home to some of the most recent refugees arriving from Syria. They really are in very desperate circumstances. They haven't got relatives here in Turkey that they can stay with. That's what a lot of Syrians manage to do. And the refugee camps around here are full. It has now become officially the world's largest host of refugees, overtaking Pakistan, some near 1.7 million Syrians in Turkey. Most of them are living amongst the community, but some 300 odd, 350,000 are in these government refugee camps. Now other countries including Jordan and Lebanon of course are also hosting Syrian refugees and in Lebanon the Syrians are now making up a quarter of that small country's population and there the services and the resources uh, that Lebanon has to provide for the Syrian refugees are under severe strain. Lebanon like Turkey is asking for more help from the international community. The civil war in Syria is now in its fifth year and the Turkish government says it spent some 5.2 billion dollars looking after Syrian refugees and Turkey says it's not getting enough help from the European Union to take refugees in or at least to provide uh, some funding, some money to help them pay for the cost of looking after these refugees. <music> Well, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Oxford is Alexander Betts, director of the Refugee Study Centre at Oxford University. And in London, we have Sharif El Sayed Ali, head of refugee and migrants rights at Amnesty International. Sharif is also an author of Amnesty's report, The Global Refugee Crisis, A Conspiracy of Neglect. Welcome to you both. Let's begin with Alexander Betts. This report paints a picture of a world that appears to be in perpetual conflict. Is that correct? I think it's an accurate picture. I think we have a global refugee crisis. But I think it's also important to recognize that it's not just a crisis of numbers. It's in a way a crisis of politics and a crisis of failure of international cooperation. Around the world, governments are closing their borders to refugees, making it more and more difficult for them to access protection. We see that in the European Union, in Australia, in regions of origin where countries like Kenya, countries like Jordan and Lebanon are increasingly being forced to close their borders because of the sheer numbers of people they're having to host. So for me, beyond the numbers and the figures that the UN Refugee Agency has released today, we need to recognize that there's a lack of leadership 
and a political failure to engage both with the root causes and to ensure protection, adequate protection, for those who are in need. Well, Sheriff El Sayed Ali, there we heard the phrase political failure. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely. I think um, it's a great challenge because the numbers are so great. But, but what's very, very clear is that uh, the, the, the world as a whole, world leaders in places that are not receiving many refugees, just do not care enough. They do not want to. They do not want to do very much. They definitely do not want people to come to their borders. They're trying everything possible to keep them elsewhere. If some countries are giving, you know, large amounts of money. But but the main thing for for you know for for, for many countries like the Europe, like in the European Union is as long as these refugees are stay away, uh, as long as you know we can play into that uh, kind of idea that that migration, we have to stop migration and kind of really kind of push that uh, migration control agenda, then, that, that, you know, that, then, then that's fine for us. And you know, what we would really like to see that's different is, is for wealthier countries to take a much bigger share of the responsibility for protecting and assisting refugees. I want to return to that point in a moment, but Alexander Betts, we run the danger here, it seems, of creating new points, new areas of conflict when you have refugees moving across borders, moving into uh, other, other countries, there is the potential for yet again a reignited conflict in those areas. It becomes almost self-propagating, does it not? Absolutely. We have to recognize that unless we protect people, there's a danger that we exacerbate the very underlying causes of insecurity. To take Syria, I mean the biggest displacement crisis in the world, people are finding it increasingly difficult to leave Syria. Border closures in the region mean that people are internally displaced. They can't get access to protection in country. And that inevitably means that when people need access to protection, their only recourse is to avail themselves of the protection of organizations like Islamic State. And if they have to turn to ISIS, that provides an opportunity for recruitment. What we have to ensure is that those people can cross a border, seek protection in neighboring countries, but equally, without adequate international support, it's understandable that a country like Lebanon, in which over a quarter of the population are Syrian refugees, over half the school-aged population are Syrian children, it's understandable that they lack capacity. In turn, those people have to move on. They can't seek protection in countries such as Libya, which don't have the capacity, so they cross the Mediterranean, end up in Europe. So unless we recognize as donor countries, as a global community, that we have to share protection, share responsibility, engage with the underlying causes, we will be exacerbating the very sources of insecurity that are causing these problems in the first place. Well, uh, Sheriff uh, Al Sayed Ali, um, it does appear that the countries that are bearing the brunt of the refugee crisis are the countries that are least able to uh, deal with it. Is that an accurate reflection? 86% of the world's refugees are in developing countries. Um, find only uh, th three countries have about 20% or 25% of these refugees. Turkey, um, uh, Pakistan, and, and Lebanon. And I mean, the, it's very, very clear that there's a very disproportionate uh, distribution of the refugee sort of, the, let's say, the burden of, of kind of the, the, um, having these large refugee populations to uh, on developing countries. And at the same time, we see that, that the wealthiest, wealthier countries, and if you take the European Union as an example, because it's a good one, we see them, you know, they're squabbling over uh, taking in how to distribute 40,000 people within the whole European Union, with 500 million people in 28 countries, whilst Lebanon, a country of about 4 million people, has 1.2 million refugees. And that's really a really, really stark difference. Well, let's just take a little bit of further uh, look at that. One aspect of this crisis that is sometimes overlooked, as we've heard, are the host countries. The UN says the world's poorest countries have taken the biggest share of people forced from their homes. 86% of refugees are in countries considered economically less developed. As we've been hearing, Turkey has become the largest refugee hosting country in the world, the majority of them Syrian. It's overtaken Pakistan, which hosts around one and a half million refugees, mostly from Afghanistan. But it's Lebanon that has taken on the biggest responsibility in relation to its population. It hosts 232 refugees for every 1,000 inhabitants. The UN says at least 15 conflicts have broken out or reignited over the past five years. Mohamed Vale reports on the burden placed on Mauritania, 
from the ongoing unrest in neighboring Mali. Life in the Mbera camp is precarious, but the severity of the elements here is nothing compared to the dangers that drove these people from their homes. Men came and began to destroy our homes. They tortured us and looted our property, including women's jewelry. We fled to a village that also came under attack by the army. Khadija too is an ethnic Tuareg, but most of the new arrivals are Fulan. They are nomads who represent a sizable tribal component within Mali. Their lives have been threatened since the emergence of a new Al-Qaeda affiliate known as the Movement for the Liberation of Masna, or simply Masna. The group has never clearly stated its objectives, but they mainly target the Malian army and when they captured some locations, they raised the Al-Qaeda flag. And whenever Masna attacks the army, the soldiers reportedly take revenge on the ethnic Fulan. We're poor people who have never done any harm to the government, but the army attacked our homes, abducted our men and forced us to pay ransoms. They accuse us of ties with Al-Qaeda, but that's not true. We know that some armed Fulan attacked some areas, but we don't have any links with them. The impact of the recent attacks can be seen here in this refugee camp on the Mauritanian side of the border. Behind me you can see some of the latest arrivals. They are being hosted here in this makeshift camp pending final registration. Some of them came only two days ago and they still speak of continuing acts of aggression and arrest by the Malian army. The UN says a new wave, mostly of Fulan refugees, has joined the camp of late. During the last two months, we have received small groups of refugees who came fleeing the conflict. We now have 107 families. We do our best to provide food, water and health services to these people. We call on the world to support this effort. The refugees complain of serious shortages of food and medical services. They say that entire months passed without any distribution of rations by relief agencies. As a peaceful resolution to the conflict is being promised by leaders, these people so far see only more difficulties in their lives here. Mohamed Val, Al Jazeera, Mbera Camp for Refugees in Basiknou. Well, Alexander Betze, we have just one slice of an example of the suffering faced by refugees and, and the causes that lead to uh, them having to leave their homes. Uh, we had reference to Libya a little bit earlier. Now, this raise, brings up another question, another issue. It was Western countries, advanced Western countries, that appeared to support regime change in Libya and yet did nothing to fill the vacuum after they had done that. Surely there should be a greater responsibility exercised by countries who are themselves, in some cases, the cause of the problem in the first place. I agree. I mean, I think there's a general responsibility that all governments around the world must share for refugees and displaced populations. But I think there's a great irony that a lot of the dynamics of contemporary displacement have been driven by the foreign policies, particularly of Western states, whether it's the foreign policies with regard to Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria or Libya. A lot of the instability that's driving displacement has come from particular interventions or particular foreign policies. And I think that means that there is an additional level of moral responsibility that we have both to address the underlying causes of displacement, but particularly to protect those in need who flee. Libya is in a particularly interesting position because not only are Libyans displaced internally within that country, but it's often been a transit country from other regions, from the Horn of Africa, from West Africa, and increasingly from the Middle East to Europe across the Mediterranean. And at the moment, Europe, rather than helping to rebuild that country adequately, is simply trying to push refugees and migrants back to North Africa, while in a way denying the responsibilities it has, both in general to protect refugees, but particularly given that many Western states have been part of some of the underlying reasons why there's insecurity in those parts of the world. Well, Sheriff El Sayed Ali, um, that's a critical point, it would appear. The responsibility that particularly Western nations have and the accusation that their actions are sometimes the cause of the refugee problem. Would you agree with that contention? Well, sometimes. I mean, it, it's not, uh, it's, it's, you know, they, they have sometimes have a, had a role or uh, have been involved in circumstances that led to 
conflicts that led to crises. So, you know, y yes, the, the, there is a link potentially in some cases, but uh, you know, it's it's much more complex as well. Um, but there are, you know, there are cases, and if you look at the Libya and the Mediterranean, where you know it's much more straightforward than that as well, because we, you know, we've known. I mean, uh, you know, everyone's won the European Union. Do not cancel your search and rescue operations. Uh, in the Mediterranean, do not slim them down. But that's exactly what happened in October of last year when Italy cancelled its Mare Nostrum uh, naval rescue operation. Uh, it was replaced by a you know, much narrower in scope operation uh, called Triton uh, that just wasn't even looking, uh, trying to rescue ships in the places where ships tend to sink, of uh, you know, the ships going from Italy to, sorry, from Libya to, to Italy with refugees and migrants. And uh, what we saw this year is that, um, you know, in just the first five months of the year, nearly 1,900 people were killed, died, um, disappeared or drowned at sea. And, and it's only then that the European Union decided that, oh, well, we do need these rescue operations after all. So sometimes it is the, really the direct uh, action or lack of action of uh, wealthy nations that has an effect and we see the same scenario going uh, you know happening as well in relation to the lack of resettlement places for refugees the very small uh, amounts of funding going to humanitarian appeals for refugees for example the South Sudan refugee um, appeal is only 11 percent funded and that's just not good enough well here we have another issue Alexander Betts uh, mentioned there of South Sudan of those 15 conflicts that the, US ha uh, that the UN has um, identified as having occurred in the past five years, eight are in Africa alone. And yet it appears that Africa, what is happening there, is scarcely on the international radar. There's a real danger at the moment that all the eyes of the international community are on the Syria crisis, and in a way that's understandable. The levels of displacement, the humanitarian crisis, the political crisis in that country, in that part of the world is very serious. But I think we've shifted away from looking at the many conflicts and sources of instability that continue to drive displacement in Africa. And Africa needs to stay on the agenda of the humanitarian and international communities. Um, it's not just South Sudan. It's also the instability in South Central Somalia continues to drive displacement within the region. Large numbers of refugees are in Kenya and Ethiopia. Elsewhere on the continent, we've seen sources of instability that have come from the Central African Republic. We see huge numbers of people being displaced. And there's a real difficulty that host countries, whether it's Kenya, whether it's the xenophobic violence in South Africa, have had in supporting um, population flows across borders. And so I think it's crucial that the international community remembers Africa in spite of what's going on elsewhere and supports protection in host countries, but also continues to engage with those conflicts. Well, Sharif Ali, we've talked about the problems, we've identified the crisis. Where do you think it, things have got to start to start addressing it on an international basis? Where do you begin with a problem of this magnitude? Well, I think you know, as as you, as you said, the um, the problem is we we keep on looking at each crisis isolated from the other, and kind of at each element within this crisis in isolation as well. I think that what really needs to happen is that you know we need to look at it as a global problem. So we need there's this whole displacement problem going on now. It's increasing, going uh, you know at at a rate that not seen for a very long time, and you know the world needs to come together. Uh, you know, we've, for example, called for an international summit to happen in the next few months to really come up, not only just discuss the issue, but actually come up with a really proper plan to, to, to solve the crisis and to solve the humanitarian crisis that we're seeing um, and look at it as a global problem with a global solution through, for example, um, resettling every single refugee that needs resettlement. The UNHCR said that uh, nearly one million people needed resettlement in 2015, yet there's only 90,000 places available for resettlement globally. That needs to change. We would like to see uh, 300,000 refugees resettled every year for the next four years. Uh, that we, you know, there is also the idea of a, a global refugee fund that would, uh, you know, identify very, very clearly all the financial needs of humanitarian operations and countries hosting large numbers of refugees and matching those with funding from wealthy countries. There's a lot to be done, but first of all, we just really need to look at it as a global problem and find the solutions 
Alexander to Betts, where, where do you think addressing the solution should begin? Is it uh, the function of an international body such as the United Nations? Does it need to be a conference of uh, Western, more developed countries, for example? Uh, wh wh where do you think it all starts? I think we have to recognize and be honest about the fact that 95% of the world's refugees are in neighboring host countries. Um, they don't, for the most part, travel great distances. Only 6% of Syrian refugees, for instance, are in Europe. Um, and I think that should lead us to recognize we have to find solutions to support the capacity of host countries, to support the capacity of Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, countries like Kenya, Tanzania, to have the capacity to host and protect refugees. Now to do that, we have to recognize that they have very real constraints in terms of security and their own development priorities in being able to host refugees. So we need a radical shift in mindset. We have to be creative about the kinds of solutions we look to. And I think one way of doing that is to see that refugees don't just have vulnerabilities, they have capacities, they often have skills, talents and aspirations. And under the right circumstances, given the right to work, given support through development assistance rather than humanitarian assistance, they can be empowered to contribute to their host societies. They can enable poorer countries to develop underdeveloped regions. They can enable middle-income countries to develop a manufacturing base. But to do that, we need additional development assistance to support countries that don't always get that assistance because they might be middle-income countries. And we have to enable the host countries on the front line of refugee protection to be empowered to receive refugees as a benefit, as a contribution, rather than be perceived and portrayed as a burden. But that requires imagination, it requires resources, and it requires our symbolic commitment through resettlement, through the strategic use of resettlement, to demonstrate that refugees are not just a problem for regions of origin, but a global and shared responsibility. Well, Sharif Ali, um, there we have a, a, a number of, of suggestions of how to deal with the issue, but it does seem to be need a multi-pronged approach. You've got to address the causes of the migrations of the refugees, but at the same time, you have got to provide some kind of support for those places that are hosting the refugees. So there needs to be action on a number of fronts here, almost simultaneously, does it not? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, obviously the, the best way of solving refugee crisis is to, um, you know, end the conflicts that, that cause most people to flee. But, but that's, as we know, is, is extremely difficult. There's a lot that needs to be there, done there. There's a lot that the Security Council needs to do so that it's an effective body rather than what it is now, which is usually not, not very effective. And the, um, but, but, you know, but we know what can be done now, and there are 20 million refugees in the world today, according to UNHCR. What, what can be done is to directly help them. There is a, a big part of it is money, and it's the political will to, to give that money, to send it through to humanitarian assistance, to development aid, as Alexandra mentioned. And also, um, there is the, you know, probably what's the most difficult thing is the political will to stand up for leaders in the European Union, in, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, to stand up and say, look, these are refugees, we will take them in, with you know this whole rhetoric about you know a few thousand people coming in and ruining our economy, ruining our society, that's that's not true. Stand up to that, be courageous, because that's really what we're lacking, and say we will do the right thing. We will host people, we will help them, we will reset the refugees and open our borders to them. Um, but we need that political will, we need that courage from world leaders, and we don't have it for the time being. Alexander Betts, uh, very quickly, an irony perhaps that the UNHCR itself was set up to deal with the one million people displaced after World War II. Now it is dealing with 60 times as many as that. A clear indication of the scale of the problem, is it not? Absolutely. But I think we need to remember the origins of the refugee regime. It was set up in Europe by European countries to address the Holocaust. It was that leadership at that moment in history that we need to replicate today. And we've seen it in the past with crises like the Indo-Chinese boat people crisis, where the world came together and 1.6 million people were resettled around the world. And we need to recall that spirit of leadership that's come in the past from Europe, that's come in the past from the United States, and this it's based on a recognition of reciprocity, shared responsibility and political imagination. Well, at that point, my thanks to our guest, Alexander Betts and Sharif El-Sayed Ali.
And thank you for watching. As always, we would like to hear your thoughts. You can contact us on our program page at aljazeera.com. You can also post your comments at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or tweet us using at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mike Hanna, and the whole team here, goodbye for now.